Hello, um, and welcome to today's um, alchemy event of Truth Serum. Um, we are going to be exploring the relationship of SEUs and universities and kind of some underlying complexities that exist within the relationship. Um, our speakers today come from a, a, a range of areas from SUs, um, spastic officer roles, um, CEOs, and also within a university institution. So our speakers today um, is Hor Fan, who'll be opening up, um, who is the University of Leicester Student Union Welfare Officer. We have Helena and Ben, who is the University Derby CEO and also the York Student Union CEO. We have Andy Winter, who'll be joining us uh, slightly later from the University of Sheffield as the Director of Student Services. And we also have Mac, who is the Newcastle University Student Officer, um, Education Officer. Um, um, so um, we'll be exploring the spastical officer's secret to a good relationship with their university, the relationship of power, accountability and misunderstanding, uh, where I've been and what I've learned along the way and what I knew then and what I know now. A nice short title for me to say. Um, and also the exercises of partnership working and exploring lots of different case studies. Um, so without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Ho, um, who will be um, doing the next presentation. Uh, hey everyone, um, my name is Hu, my pronouns are she, her. I'm currently the Students' Union uh, Wellbeing Officer at Leicester University. Um, and I'm 21 years old. Uh, previously, I did my law degree here at University of Leicester. And essentially today, what I'm really excited to talk about is um, just kind of my experience over the last, uh, coming up to 11 months now into uh, the role. Um, I've recently been re-elected um, for a second term, which I'll be commencing um, from the 1st of June onwards. So kind of what I've learned, how I adjusted to it, and what I'd say is kind of, I guess the little tips and tricks that I've learned over the last few months of how to um, how to get on with the university and, and really why um, we can actually be an asset in their work um, and vice versa. Um, and so one of the first things that I wanted to talk about today was essentially the very question that we're looking at today, um, you know, why universities actually need SUs. Um, and I think that one of the first things that I learned from quite early on, um, having done political advisory work from a younger age, um, was that actually, you know, young people and, and the voices that we bring to the table are very, very important. Um, but often organisations and institutions like universities don't quite know what to do with them or how best to actually engage young people. Um, there are many young people that I see on a day to day basis, um, arguably SABs included, who are very passionate about making change and passionate about being involved. Um, but institutions like universities constantly miss the mark with regards to actually engaging them um, and actually giving them viable opportunities to sit at the table and influence policy and agenda. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest assets that we as a student union actually can use to our advantage uh, when it comes to actually fostering that relationship with universities and with um, our counterparts, um, like the registrar, like even the VC at times, um, who I've certainly enjoyed a close relationship with over the last few months here in Leicester. Um, and I think that that student engagement piece is something that institutions across the board struggle with. Um, we've seen it after COVID where, you know, student numbers and particularly student numbers are on campus have fluctuated largely um, just like Leicester alone. Our international population, which is something that we rely on heavily, uh, both with regards to from a financial perspective, but also the diversity and the culture perspective. Um, it took a massive um, dip in the wake of COVID. Our campus was a lot quieter um, in the years where hybrid learning was a thing. And only now, um, this year, yeah, where, uh, has been the past year where we've seen, you know, busier than ever campus and a lot of that has been due to the SU and its um, engagement with students. And I think that's where we've been able to really show the university this year and years before, but predominantly this year, maybe I'm biased because um, I've been here, but essentially we've been able to really show the university that actually we get student engagement right, we're not perfect, we're working on it. But we're a powerful tool for universities to actually work with, um, not against, and vice versa for us to work with universities, utilize the resources that we have across the board, shared passion, shared commitment, and actually engage in people and actually engage our student population and learn from them. 
And I think one of the other things that we do really well at SU is and why we're an asset to our universities is essentially the fact that we're the, you know, we're the most legitimate voice of students in terms of you have, in our case, six um, executive officers who set the agenda at SU side, were elected by students year on year. This year we saw um, the highest voter turnout um, in, I think, a decade or, or near about. And I think that really shows that actually student voice is very much um, able to be harnessed, able to be championed um, by SUs. What we need is universities to actually recognise that, actually listen to us when we've been elected and actually listen to us when we say this is what students need, this is what we're hearing from them. And I think that's something that we've been really trying to peddle. I think that legitimacy piece has been very important. And I think ultimately, as soon as universities understand that SUs are, you know, the most democratic it gets, I guess, in terms of this higher education setting, um, I think that's where universities can then kind of unlock that closer and special relationship with SUs and actually work with us um, to actually benefit students and meet the needs of students um, and essentially leads to um, better, I guess, um, satisfaction on both sides. You know, students are happy with their SU and the way that we're able to actually relay things back to the university. And equally, that has domino effect and, you, you know, they're happy with the university and the fact that it's receptive to what university students are actually saying. Um, essentially, they're the ones paying and, you know, we're the ones that kind of make sure that their needs are addressed and their concerns are taken forward. Um, but I think what has been really interesting to see is also just how much um, universities do have to kind of um, I guess unwillingly sometimes even, um, reach out to SUs, particularly when it comes to things like TEF, which we've seen over the course of this year, where, you know, student unions had to write their own submission. Um, yes, the university could offer their services in terms of, you know, support with regards to data, which we certainly benefited from, from we certainly benefited from that as a union. Um, but essentially, it was very much the SU will write their own submission. This will be down to execs and the engagement piece that we did with students and the university will have you know very little um you know sight of that really and very little um scope to input i mean we were going to say what we we're going to say and some of it was some of it was harsh truths and some of it was actually praise because you know we've benefited from a closer relationship with the university in recent years um and that's something that has enhanced uh, teaching standards and education and student experience but I think also looking at OFS, um, looking at, you know, uh, in recent times, we've seen um, OFS and their, um, their kind of work around sexual violence policy and sexual harassment. Um, and I think that, again, those are things where the university has to come up and reach out to us um, for all the reasons mentioned already, student engagement, student voice, legitimacy, um, actually getting young people involved um, because the university often misses the mark with that but also because it's becoming the norm to actually have your student union embedded in the work you do day to day. So it's very much you cannot reach out to a student union or conveniently forget about them or leave them to a side and, and you know, pick up where it feels convenient for you, but rather they must be at that table and they must be there from the onset. And I think over the course of the last few years where we've enjoyed a close relationship and particularly over this year where um, we've benefited from a, from a pretty decent block grant as well, which has certainly meant that we've been able to actually deliver more work and actually take back more data and more insight from students and more satisfaction from students directly to the university. I think that has meant that the university actually understands that engaging with us proactively rather than reactively means that we can also make sure that the university and, and you know, our wider institution as a whole stays ahead of the curve when it comes to um, sector changes, when it comes to um, looking at what competitive universities are doing. Um, and actually, we can make our university look quite good, you know, because a lot of the time students will conflate what the SU does and what the university does. And as a result, it's like, the University of Leicester is amazing. They're doing all this work on cost of living. Actually, it's a union, but, you know, students looking inwards will have a very different understanding of that. And sometimes that helps the university. And, you know, surely um, for them, we've seen that they're never kind of, they never shy away from putting that on any of their pamphlets or any of their brochures or mentioning anything that has conveniently been done in partnership um, on an open day. And I think it is those little things where we give a little in terms of yes you can mention it but in return you know we've got to get that commitment are you going to actually get behind the work are you actually going to empower us to deliver it and actually take our insights on board and I think that's what I really have felt has been kind of my understanding of why you know why the university really needs us and certainly what where I feel we've been able to best slot in with the university over the course of the um, few months that I've been here. Um, I think along the way, there's been a few lessons that I've learned um, and that's kind of the next bit that I'm gonna be looking at. And essentially, 
I think one of the first things that I learned quite early on, um, and this was down to a fantastic um, introduction program that we had, uh, where we met with everyone from, you know, from the VC all the way down to the, the kind of SU staff, which sounds silly because we'll be seeing them for, you know, every day that we're in the office, but it really helped to understand all the roles that we, and all the people that we had um, kind of in our circle really, and in our space, um, their supporters. And I think it was very important on every level, both internally in the SU and on the university side, to identify the key stakeholders and find allies, you know, people that shared your passion, had similar experiences. So, um, you know, I've, I've found so much um, support and so much, I think, um, solidarity with a lot of, um, you know, university colleagues who have previously worked in, in the city council and actually have worked in local politics. And when I've mentioned that that's something I've worked in before, you know, I've worked with policy advisory, I've worked with um, local national politicians, I've worked with the European Parliament, and they were like, oh, that's really cool, tell me more. And I think that led to a very, very good work relationship from the onset, because it was that shared kind of commitment, that shared understanding. And I think it was very important um, to build those relationships from the start, um, before you went in with the big asks, namely money. Um, but I think finding those allies and keeping hold of them has been something that I really found successful and has really benefited me in my work. And, you know, I, I touched upon this already, but I think using that shared understanding, that shared values, um, you know, that shared experience, I guess also, um, and sometimes it's just shared frustrations as well. I think when you get to a certain point, um, some university staff will be quite candid and, and this goes all the way up to like, you know, the registrar and sometimes even the VC, um, they'll share your, your frustrations. So like, you know, myself and the VC have had various conversations with, uh, you know, about period poverty and the fact that actually on campus where we've started the conversation, we've started the provision, but it hasn't quite expanded in the way that we would have thought. And I was like, brilliant, you're the VC, you can do something about it. Um, and I think it is those little kind of, um, that, that little kind of polite, but slight nudge that you can kind of give once you kind of have built those relationships and actually understood that, you know, so-and-so person is very interested in X, um, you know, the subject area, what can I do and how can I actually maximize that relationship to make sure that they are able to push on my behalf as well and we're able to work together and create change. And I think I mentioned this before, but I think it's very um, easy as a student union sometimes and as a SAB sometime to kind of be taught to fall into the common notion of, you know, we're by nature meant to hate the the university and, you know, we're meant to oppose them and we're meant to be critical of them. And that that's true. You know, we are, like I said, we're elected, we're the legitimate voice of students. And yes, there are frustrations that students will come to us with, which we're very, very much in our right to actually raise. Um, and, you know, the best part is that we're separate from the university, which means we can do that. Um, however, I think that when it comes to problem solving, I think it's very important to look at Right. Are we on the same page? Do we both agree that it's a problem? Does the university also recognise the issue and recognise their shortcoming? And actually, is it better to actually work with them and to actually want to collaborate um, and to kind of sit down at the table with them rather than just kind of knocking on the door and telling them how terrible they are and kind of really taking a very militant approach to it? And I think that that's something that I really um, wanted to do in my work and I've certainly, you know, I guess in my understanding, I've been able to do that, um, where I've kind of been like, this is a problem, I'm hearing it directly from students, I'm sure you're hearing it too, or you have or will hear it, let's sit down and talk about it together. And oftentimes that has meant that actually that um, that critical friend piece and kind of that offer of sense checking and, and kind of working with is much more palatable and much more nicer um, for them to deal with rather than us going in telling someone who's on a much much higher pay scale than us and has probably years of experience that I don't um, hello sorry you're doing all the wrong stuff and you're terrible at your job and they're like wow okay um, I don't really want to talk to you anymore I'm suddenly busy for the next three months um, and so that's something that I've tried to really kind of embed in my work and something that I think I learned along the way um, I think when I came in it was very very um, I guess it like the underlying notion was, you know, the university is terrible, we hate them. And it's like, right, okay, I, I agree <laughs> because I was a student here, but what can we do to actually nitpick, you know, um, like certain bits where they're absolutely failing and actually appreciate some of the things that they're, you know, committed to working on and have successfully worked with us on. And where can we kind of find that, yes, you did X really well, now let's have that same energy and let's have that same charisma for X issue. Or, you know, actually we worked really well on this, let's continue working together and, and you know, look at the success we've been able to have. And I mentioned this before, but I think there's a lot of um, motivating external factors that universities will 
um, look to us for and, and where we'll be able to, as an SU, um, really kind of channel that um, participation piece. And I think a lot of that, um, certainly in the case of my university, um, has been um, PR. So, you know, with, with regards to sexual violence and, um, you know, um, Me Too on campus and things like that, um, it's very much been, right, let's work together because it's, you know, there's, there's high to media interest. Um, students are asking about it, the local media is asking about it. Um, there's being articles written, what can we do? Um, how can we help? How can we work together? What are we kind of, you know, what's our strategy? And I think sometimes it is, you know, yes, that sounds shallow, but sometimes it is PR that actually motivates the university to actually work on issues that it actively wants to avoid and things like sexual violence policies um, and, you know, things like cost of living even are some of the things where they know they've got to invest money into, you know, um, introducing or, or improving the system. They don't actually want to do that because no institution ever wants to put money where you know where you need it really. But they're like, okay, bigger picture. We've got media focus. We've got people asking questions. What can we do? Work with the students' union. They've actually, and I think at that point, um, what really helps is being ready with a plan and actually having something to you know present to them and actually say, look, you've got to do something about it. I know exactly what would be a good starting point. Let's sit down, let's work together. And suddenly they're very, very receptive because you know they're they're like a deer point headlights and the university needs to do something but doesn't know what and are bogged down in their own processes and, and they know that if they try to work internally with all their different groups, particularly in our university's case, we have working groups for every single thing. So if they try to go through that system, it will take a couple of months for them to actually even, you know, get a blog post written or something. Um, and I think also OFS and things like that, and also competitive universities, I think, you know, we often look at universities across um, our region, what are they doing, what are they not doing, what, what you know, what are we missing on? And I think a lot of that has meant that the university has looked at us and said, look, um, X university is getting student engagement really, you know, nailing it really well. What can you, how, how can we work with you? How can we actually support you to do similar here? And it's like, it's those opportunities where you can really come in as an SU and you can really come in as an officer and really influence, really change um, things. And I think also it's very important along the way, um, these are things that I mentioned before, so sorry, I'm going through the same kind of things again. Um, but I think it is very important to stop and actually appreciate, um, you know, where things have actually worked well and where the university has actually been very receptive to your work um, and it's led to it's led to success. Um, and I think that's really helped with regards to, you know, X worked really well, now let's move on. And what do you think about this? <laughs> and sometimes it is kind of that worked really well. Now would you potentially fund another project? And that's fine because I think what they will also appreciate is that you're kind of appreciating their involvement in it. And it's not just it was an SU piece of work and that's it. Because yes, we did the work, but let's face it, it wouldn't have been possible without the money coming from the university. And it's very, very important to acknowledge that, I think. And that's something that I know some of my colleagues and some um, of the other SABs that I've spoken to are very, very much like, no, no, it was SU work. It was, absolutely, it was. You know, we we delivered it, but it was mobilised by the university and it was, you know, it was given that green light by the university. It's very, very important for them to actually be acknowledged in that way because it means that they understand they, the part that they played in it and the part they play in our wide successes, and it becomes a us thing um, rather than a you know we did it on the SU side and and you guys are different, um, and I think that that's been kind of the main lessons that I've learned um, over the course of um, you know my ten to eleven months here. Um, I think one of the biggest um, things that I've also learned about is um, is data. I think and you know how we can. Um, really use data to actually influence what we're saying and actually really add value to our work. Um, and I think that when I was working on cost of living, one of the biggest things that I thought um, was really, really powerful, um, I'm gonna cough, I'm so sorry. Don't worry, I've got such a cough at the minute, it's terrible, so don't worry. Right, um, I'm back. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I found really uh, powerful and re very, very useful, particularly when it came to actually doing that most important ask, as in SAB, which was asking the university for money, was actually taking back data and predominantly data that was 
directly um, the result of me engaging with students. Um, like I mentioned earlier, one of the biggest um, pieces of work that we're able to deliver where universities find value in, in the work that SUs provide is that student engagement piece, is that kind of um, chatting with students and actually getting their views on board for the university to kind of get a steer of where, where students are at. And I think um, taking that back and actually embedding, you know, direct quotes from things like Microsoft Forms, it, it wasn't anything fancy because I'm not a data, you know, pro. Um, but when I did a trial for um, my free breakfast project, essentially what I did was I incentivized a questionnaire on Microsoft um, Forms with um, a few Just Eat and Uber Eats vouchers. Um, and, you know, I got university students who were attending to actually um, fill out a few boxes of information, you know, a few of those swipe bars where you can break things out of 10, but also add in direct comments and quotes about what they enjoyed, whether they wanted the provision to continue. And essentially, when I actually prepared that report for the university, um, outlining the cost that the project would, um, you know, be, um, you know, the cost that I calculated for the project, um, I actually embedded those quotes and that actually direct student input into it. Um, where I said, you know, you know, X amount of people, I think it was 101, um, students replied to, to my feedback form and this is directly what they said. And actually 100% of them said X. And I think that that was something that was directly, the registrar actually sent me an email to say, really liked your report. It was very, very good. It was very comprehensive and it didn't, it wasn't long. It was two and a half pages and there was no fancy diagrams or any fancy um, kind of, fonts or anything like that. It was essentially just, this is this is why you need the provision. This is what I've done. This is why I know it works. This is what I'm proposing, how much it costs. This is what students are saying, done. Um, I know that university you know, staff are very busy. And so I think the key is to very much keep that information short, I think. And certainly that's worked in all the proposals that I've done over the months that I've been here. But I think that that really shows that it's not just an idea that sounds good in your head and it's not just an idea that sounds good to five of your colleagues in the SU who are very much there to support your work and, and enable you and will not actually probably tell you um, that, you know, sorry, who are the idea sucks <laughs> and it's never going to work, um, even if they're thinking that. And I think it's only when you embed student um, data and actually show that you've done that research, you've done that communication piece already, um, do universities also know that if it doesn't happen, there are students who are very much involved and engaged and they'll they'll have something to say about it and I think it was very much um kind of this is why you need it because if so many people are asking for it um just in the space of three days when I did a trial with minimal kind of you know promotion imagine the you know imagine the comments you'll get over the year if you don't do it and I think it was that kind of like worst case scenario peddling as well um but I think with regards to data I think what was really important for me was kind of making sure that it was Directly, you know, direct quotes from students. Um, they were, you know, I asked them if they would be happy to actually, um, if needed, to come to a roundtable discussion with the registrar. Essentially, it wasn't needed because he was very receptive of the idea anyway, and was very, very happy to find he actually by the next morning with yes, go ahead, I'll transfer the funds, which is the best email to ever wake up to, quite honestly. Um, but you know, I know that it's not always that easy, and I think that what I've always done proactively now is just. By default, um, I'll go in with that data piece, with that student engagement piece having already been done. And it doesn't need to be many students, I think, you know, even if it's 10, even if it's 15, even if it's five, really. But I think it's just that that value of I've spoken to students, this is what they really want. And it's not just me saying it, it's students saying it. Um, and I think moving on to kind of what I say on my two top success stories or the piece of work that I'm very proud of, of kind of having achieved over the course of this year. Um, I've mentioned this quite a lot already, but cost of living and the kind of um, free breakfast uh, program that I was able to, to kind of actually initiate and deliver um, between November and, and now really um, was kind of of the highlight and we were one of the first universities to do at the time um it received coverage from the bbc um and Leicester mercury at the time um and the university were very very happy with that naturally because they um did what media does best and completed the university in union and so they i was apparently an employee of the university which is uh probably not nice for um the su but never mind um but i think what was really kind of helpful with cost of living was looking at the fact that it wasn't a Leicester issue, it wasn't a University of Leicester issue either. And it wasn't a, because of the makeup of our student population, this is an issue. It was very much just a national issue. It won't go away in a year, it won't go away in a month. You know, what are we gonna do? We need to sit down and actually have a plan. We can't do this whole, you know, we'll see as it goes and, and to, you know, play by ear. 
thing. Um, and, you know, NUS have published so much um, about, you know, how it was impacting students um, across the sector, you know, universities, we were one of the last universities to actually put our press release about, you know, what our cost of living strategy was, which was quite disappointing um, because we had it all down on paper. What it did was just, it took forever to go through the process um, and for it, get, it to get the PR seal of approval, um, but hey, uh, university policies. Um, and I think that that pressure across the sector meant that even if that final PR piece took so long, there was still, you know, the process had started already on our side and it started already internally where we started doing, you know, I got the funding for that breakfast. We started looking at a one-off payment, which a lot of universities did and, and you know, we weren't the first to do it. And um, the university dragged their feet a lot about it. Um, but essentially we did it and it was a big success. Um, it was a bit lower than other universities, which is something that we're working on next year with the university to actually increase that. But essentially it happened. And I think that using that, um, using that media coverage about various things that we were doing, using that um, student engagement, you know, students were emailing and asking how you can help with the cost of living crisis and actually saying, look, what would be really nice is to have that comprehensive um, joint approach where we can actually go back to students and say, we're doing X, Y, Z with the university, um, here's a support package and actually the same thing to the media. And I think, again, that positive PR spin to it meant the university was suddenly working to very, very tight deadlines and actually, you know, respond to emails a lot faster. And yes, it's shallow. Yes, it's not, you know, it shouldn't take positive PR for university to actually care about, about its students. But if it works, why not harness it? And actually, you have more power to sit at that table and say, why did it take, you know, the positive PR angle for you to actually work on it? Why was it not? actually our students are impacted negatively and, and we should do something about it but that's a conversation that you can embed into your work going forward there's no point kind of burning that bridge right now um, particularly when you know that the university will be mobilized and will be engaged if this is a, if this is the kind of spin that you take at the moment and again I think that really showing your value as an officer really showing your value as an SU um, and you know going back with that direct student input that direct student voice um, you know, those students complaining to us all the time and what it took was collating that and actually taking that back to the monthly meetings that we have with the registrar, with senior university staff um, and, you know, even with the VC at times where we literally met him in the corridor and it was like, brilliant, I've got to actually speak to you about something, students are complaining about X. And I think it was taking that, you know, all the way through to the top. Um, but I think, again, we were able to show that as an officer, I have that access to students, they're coming to me, that they trust me to actually tell me they're struggling, we need to do something about it. And I think similar with um, sexual violence and sexual misconduct, where um, you know students complained for a long time that our um, our processes were not fit for purpose. I completely agree. There are massive gaps in resources that we have um, across the board, and essentially, I think what was one of the biggest, um, I guess, opportunities for me, which I really took um, on and tried to make the most of, was we. You know, we had a restructure in the university where we recruited um, a new director of student services and um, well-being and belonging. And I think from the start, my first conversation with the, with the new recruit was very much all focused about you come from a different institution. What do you what did your institution do about you know sexual violence and, and you know misconduct? How does it deal with it? We do a terrible job. Basically, I went straight in. It was very very much we, it's terrible here. Please help. And I think that what I think what the biggest benefit of, of doing that and taking that, uh, you know, I want to work with you, you're new and I'm really, you know, passionate and I, and I hear from students daily, please let's do something about it. What the biggest, I guess, positive of that was, was this person was not bogged down in processes. Quite honestly, they didn't care about doing things the right way um, because they were so new and, and you know, they, didn't, they, they weren't, I guess, coached into the University of Leicester way of doing things, which is, you know, slow, reactive pieces. Um, and and they were you know passionate about making change as anyone in the you know taking up a new role is they were very much you know enthused by the idea of this being one of the first pieces of work that they do and being a big piece of work that they do and it worked we were able to actually work with them with the director we were able to work with her and actually look at the fact that the OFS were putting all these you know new asks on the table about what they want institutions to publish what they want you you know institutions to adopt that whole single you know document um, outlining your strategy um, being more transparent with the rates of uh, reports that we get which is where we said you know as an institution if we don't do something about it we're going to struggle quite badly we're going to look quite bad because our reporting rates are 
an all time high, but the rate um, of students that actually go through the conduct process all time low, literally single figures, like you know, single figures. Um, so I think where that where we were able to show that actually that disparity between those two numbers will look very bad on us if we are just kind of seeming to look like we've accepted it and it's the norm and we just go on with it. What we actually need to do is reconvene the sexual violence working group, which for some reason got disbanded before I even started. So that in the whole time I've been here, we never met. It was meant it was meant to be something that I'd sit on and quite um very much chair, but it wasn't something that ever happened. Um, and no one was ready to pick it up because it's one of those pieces that the university was like, mm, sensitive topic, let's not talk about it. New person came in and they're like, actually, we need to talk about it. And I'm like, I agree, let's do it. Happened. We've had three meetings since. She's only been in the role for three months, so I've kept her busy. Um, and, you know, there's been a new, there's been 25k worth of resource put into a new caseworker. And yes, that doesn't solve the problem, but it's 25k more than we had last year dedicated to you know SV and actually tackling that and actually being able to support students proactively rather than doing the reactive support piece um and I think again using that data using you know working with our um you know our standing together team and actually you know asking them for those raw numbers and actually taking the numbers to the university and to this director and actually saying look reporting rates are really low please let's do something about it you're going to look quite stupid right now if if this is how things continue. Um, and quite honestly, you've taken on this role, but the buck will fall on you. Um, and, you know, yes, you're new, but no one will care when the OFS um, asks for transparency and your name is attached to the report. And I think it was, you know, putting that on the table and actually saying, look, you're going to look quite bad and you're going to look quite inept. Let's do something about it. Um, and I think we're in a position to actually be able to say that. Sometimes it is kind of being a critical friend, being, you know, that person who delivers a harsh truth, but sometimes that's what they need to actually get going. Um, and I think what was really important to consider was kind of where the sensitivities and where the kind of hesitation from the university came over the last few years. So my predecessor in the role was very, very much, you know, the university doesn't do anything at all for SV, it's terrible, um, and that's it, bottom line. I was like, right, okay, let's see where we've gone wrong. And I think a lot of that came down to reputational risk, you know, OIA, what if the university gets sued? And actually it was very much putting that on the table, understanding that and saying, look, if it's negative media that you're worried about, if it's risk to reputation, if it's legal risks, let's mitigate that, let's work on it. I think what, and I think turning that back, so they, the university here was worried about getting, um, you know, legal proceedings being taken by those who were, implicated by the conduct process. However, what they failed to consider was actually that those who felt they weren't supported enough through that conduct process could very much have rise to actually, you know, proceed with, um, you know, a legal case against the university too. And just because a survivor hadn't taken them to court yet doesn't mean that there won't be a survivor who will. And I think putting that on the table and actually having um, certain, uh, I guess, voices in our Me Too on Campus uh, movement over the last few years who have very much, you know, toyed with the idea of actually proceeding with, um, you know, taking the university through the legal processes meant that this was a very real risk. And I think turning that narrative and actually saying, look, you've got to make it proportionate, otherwise, you know, you've not considered one risk and you're leaving yourself very exposed. And I think that meant that instantly there was commitment, instantly suddenly the, you know, the, the very university saying there was no money, um, was very much like, okay, 25K, you need it, take it. And I think that was very much where I came from with regards to SV. Some of it was harsh truths, but some of it was also understanding where the university came from and, and kind of working with that and countering that. And I guess in some way, providing that safety blanket for them where if it's a collaborative thing, they don't get all the blame for it. And and that was quite powerful for them because, you know, no one wants to be the person in the firing line when it comes to things like SV. And the SU actively saying, let's do it a collaborative thing and we'll, we'll actually pick up some of that responsibility if things don't go to plan was very powerful for them. And I mean, it's worked so far. So I think that, you know, I yes, it hasn't solved everything. And yes, we've got a long way ahead, um, both financially and both in terms of, you know, morally, I think. Um, but I think that having that conversation started and certainly having staff on side and those allies that I've been able to discover has been very, very kind of powerful in making sure that it at least gets the airtime on the agenda that it requires and that it deserves. Um, and I think essentially that's kind of my experience over the last 11 months. Um, and that's kind of where I think SUs really fit into the university jigsaw and, and how we can really 
add to to universities sorry that I've gone over to no no not at all um thank you so much for that it's really interesting I've written loads of questions down um, and I think it's really interesting to explore kind of the, the stakeholder mapping and the the motivations for collaborative work and um that kind of power play that you've you've explored there um I'll hand over to Kalina and Ben for their next session thank you uh, no problem thanks Molly um and I'd just like to say a thank you for Alchemy to, uh, for having us. Um, we were asked to consider a really common question about improving the relationships between universities and unions, almost that if you had a magic wand, what would that look like? And uh, fortunately, Ben and I have spoken about this in another forum, and so I welcome the, the chance to work with him again. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to give Ben the opportunity to introduce himself. Yeah, hi, I, I'm, I'm Ben. I'm the uh, chief exec at the, the University of York Students' Union, and uh, a cleaner will, will explain what we're going to talk about. Thank you. Um, my name's Kalina. I'm the CEO at Del the Union of Students at Derby. Um, I've worked in a number of uh, unions since graduating as an officer, uh, numerous roles within membership and latterly becoming uh, the CEO. Um, I wanted to introduce myself using my pronouns. It's a very common thing to do, but my pronouns are she, her. Um, and this is not necessarily so common. Uh, I am. A, I describe myself as a woman who is black as opposed to a black woman. And I wanted to say that because I wanted to illustrate a point about power. I think in the absence of clarity, people will define you based on how they think they should define you. And this can be based on societal uh, values. So in the context of power, I think it's really important to try and attempt to re redress any of those sort of power dynamics through openness and also a potential sense of vulnerability to a certain extent. Now, that's not to suggest that this won't be ignored consciously or otherwise, but in the context of power, if you can move on to the next slide for me, Molly, um, I've just used me and that as an example of how partnerships should be a mutual, uh, have mutual understanding and respect towards the power that exists within that relationship. So by being honest about that power, both the university and the, univ the union recognise the imbalances. Um, one institution one party has the money the resources the data the time and the other one has the weight of the students as Hor was saying earlier um and interestingly within student unions we don't have the red tape that surrounds um many of the things that the universities do so it's really important to kind of look at that power dynamic and how that can work either in your favor or against you over to you ben yeah, so, so I want to share a few kind of practical examples of how, as a CEO, I'm perhaps helping student officers and, and students and the university to um, understand those power imbalances and, and, and change them. To a large extent, I see a lot of my job as, uh, as being about helping officers learn how to recognise that power inequity and, and start to manage it in a different way. Um, uh, so, so, so creating and shifting power dynamics is, is my job. Um, uh, some interesting examples, uh, you know, we, we, we've put into place at York, um, uh, the university's student life committee is jointly chaired by, by a university registrar and the president of the students' union. And that's both a statement about the equal value, but it's also a practice that allows both of them to, 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 to navigate and push and pull on the agenda to shape and evolve the conversations that take place in that committee. Um, and, and so, so it's, it's, it's both a kind of principle and a practice. And um, interestingly, the, the University Council, we've now established a, 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 a regular occurrence each year, where as part of their development day, um, an hour and a half of the agenda for Council is handed over to our Liberation Network. So the Students' Union bring in part-time officers and Liberation leaders who talk about their own personal lived experience with some of the most senior decision makers in the institution, which then in turn allows those stories to permeate their, their decision making uh, in, in future. So, so we're really changing the power dynamics in the room. Uh, it, it's often fascinating to watch, uh, you know, uh, let, let's use some cliches, some some pale white men in suits who are, who are perhaps not sitting on the council, sit down with, with people who look and speak differently to them. And, and, and their job is to listen in that forum, and it really shifts the power dynamic. And um, if we go on to the next slide, the second area we wanted to talk about was about um, uh, the balance of accountability. Now, I, I think there has to be a mutual accountability uh, b between universities and unions. Um, and that's both about formal accountability structures and informal structures. 
I sometimes describe the idea of kind of accountability as you know a bit like a family. Um, and, and families are accountable to one another. They're, they're, they're families, of course, are, can be wonderfully dysfunctional. Uh, brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, you know, et cetera, et cetera, can fight with each other. But they learn how to get over it. And they learn how to get over it because of the kind of shared values and the shared commitment, sometimes spoken, sometimes unspoken, about the rules of engagement within that family dynamic. And, and I think the institutional relationship between a university and a student's union is quite similar. It needs to be quite proactively engaged with. Um, and as I say, so there, there are lots of formal examples of accountability. We have to account for it when we transfer money for in the block grant or when facilities have a contract in place to, to, to work out as huge. These are all formal accountabilities. But, but what's much more interesting is the informal accountabilities those kind of unspoken rules of, of how you talk to each other and, and share information and intelligence with one another. I think Colleen has got a few examples. Thank you. Um, following on from that, we, we do, as student unions, try to be transparent to our students. We circulate our accounts and, and try to make these meaningful for students uh, quite often in the context of our annual general meetings, which without putting too fine a point on it, can be the most dull meeting that you might actually have to go to. But what we have to try and do is make those visual representations about how our money is spent, um, but in the context of collaboration and mutual accountability with universities, universities should be invited or could be invited to attend the AGM and have that direct accountability to our students in the same way that we do. Um, they can present to those in attendance. They can be asked those direct questions um, as Hoare and uh, Ben have both alluded to. Student unions are often the place that have that weight of student voice and, and student feedback. So why is it that we deny the university the opportunity to be part of that? In the same way that the university can be invited to our trustee boards, assuming that they don't already occupy a role there and uh, be questioned and asked questions of. Um, and unions on the converse can be asked to demonstrate their impact through any sort of level of university governance structures and, and council meetings. And I think what's interesting is talking about sort of informal um, methods of accountability. There's always that sort of joke, that sort of commonality about um, you've got to be in the room and potentially women weren't necessarily in the room that these discussions were being held at. Perhaps the room doesn't exist anymore. And actually, what's really interesting is finding out where you can hold those conversations so that you are still part of that um, level of respect and level of um, trust and accountability. In, in other sort of ways, there are me meetings whereby your agendas are circulated in advance, um, and that's joint meetings between the institutions. Um, but also these are circulated to students to demonstrate the questions and obviously the answers that are posed of either party. And in that way, by sharing them with students, we're giving ourselves as unions additional credibility. We're showing our mandate. We're showing the bargaining power that we potentially have. And we're allowing our students to be able to continue to demonstrate their in involvement, their importance, the feedback that they provide. Um, and it potentially gives us a stronger, a stronger position when bargaining with the university, because we're saying it's not just us that think this. It is this student voice that we have following us. Um, and then there's the joint leadership and uh, communication. It's really important um, to be able to work on things together. And Hall touched on a couple of those. The TEF, for example, um, unlike Leicester's approach, the Uni Union of Students in the University of Derby worked quite collaboratively on, on our TEF submission. Um, and in a similar way, we will be working on our access and participation in the same way. We want to be accountable to our students. We want to ensure that people kind of appreciate that there is a sense of working together for the benefit of the student experience and sometimes there is that again I'm sort of stealing from from Hall that kind of sense of us and them sometimes our students don't differentiate between who is us and who is them and actually does it matter to a student as long as they're getting the best out of that experience so it's really important to be able to sort of be to work together and to communicate together even though we might be two separate organizations so Molly can I ask you to move on to the next slide please Sorry, I've just done something to my screen and uh... oh, apologies. As long as I haven't done anything to <laughs> Sorry, my technical flabbiness is not on point. I love it's to do that. Right slide, isn't it? 
<laughs> in terms of misunderstanding, I did a communication studies degree many, many moons ago. And one of the basic models of communication is that what is said isn't necessarily what is heard. And that can be intentional or otherwise. Um, we, it's not necessarily us, but as, as a class, we kind of noted that there was noise, noise that interfered with the message at each stage. And sometimes that noise is unintentional and it's just other factors that come into play. And at other times that noise can be very deliberate and that's used to the advantage of either party. And so within the context of student unions and universities, the nature of the relationship should be based on mutual expectations and a respect for the role that each other plays. But equally, we think that it should allow for that space for misunderstandings too. Um, and some of the questions that we've asked here are how many times is an SU member of staff easily confused with an SU officer? Um, whilst I was in Sunderland, it was made even worse because we called our staff members officers. So it didn't then help that differentiation. And sometimes, we have to ask, is that to downplay the information that's given or is that to somehow make you act as if you deserve the respect of the room? Um, and sometimes in that whole kind of, no, 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 this is who I am and this is what I do. And no, I'm not elected and I, I'm a full time member of staff that adds to the theatre of that relationship. So there are potentials for deliberate misunderstanding of protocols. Um, sometimes as I kind of touched on in terms of accountability the university has all the money and all the time but they sometimes take a very long time to do things and so there might be examples of when student unions need to come in and act more quickly and again I'm sort of picking up on what Hall was saying that sometimes a, the unit the student union rather does things it's that whole kind of it's better to ask for forgiveness rather than permission and we can do that sometimes there are often opportunities and examples where ceos of um universities and um student unions the vice chancellors and, and ceos and presidents play good cop bad cop against each other in order to get the best out of that situation sometimes it's easier to say the university is making me do this in order to get something done and similarly um, unions, universities can rely on the fact that there is that data that Hall was talking about, that student unions can collate to present to universities to say, you need to be doing this because it needs to happen. Whereas that might not necessarily be in their initial interests, but by putting that pressure on in terms of this is the voice of the students, we, um, we make it happen a bit more quickly, should I say. So I'll hand back over to Ben. Yeah, thanks. I, I mean, look, I, I think you've just described the the, the challenge of, of, of recognising different cultures and, and using that advantageously, beautifully, Gleena. Um, my advice here is is that both organisations need to be very explicit about differentiating culture, and by being explicit about it, you reduce problematic misunderstandings. You know, uh, 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 you know, tripping over one another. Um, and actually allow one another to use those differences in culture to, to, to mutual benefit. And um, students' unions, as Colleen says, are massively more agile than universities. And there will be times when using that agility is advantageous. Uh, COVID, there was loads of examples around the UK where universities needed to learn how to move quickly and to have a different risk appetite. And they recognised that their students' unions had that agility, had a different risk appetite, and an understanding of how people were going to react and behave in this unusual situation. And so they pushed opportunities or, or projects or initiatives or, or perhaps communications to their students' union to deliver. Equally, there will be other times when a student's union needs a kind of academic voice and a, and a data set to, to reason and evidence the rationale for the speaker being on campus or, or whatever it might be. And, and by recognising those different um, uh, voices that can present something, the different data, the different uh, attitudes and behaviours, it can be used very advantageously. I, I think I think sometimes when I talk about partnership and the partnership ideology I try and bring myself, uh, that partnership ideology prevents um, officers and students from applying pressure from, from campaigning, perhaps, from being aggressive or, or questioning. And, and I think it's about the mutual understanding that allows the partnership to simultaneously be one of mutual challenge. Um, and, and so I think if, th if this is the area that you really need to think about in order to create a partnership that allows uh, teeth to be shown from time to time or questions to be asked. Um, Molly, if you can flip to the, to the final slide, or penultimate slide, sorry, um, I, I mean, look, here I just shared a couple of pieces of theory that, that, that friends and colleagues can go away and have a look at if it's helpful. Uh, the Partnership Initiative do some really 
um, interesting stuff for, uh, um, uh, around uh, power. And, and power is such a fascinating question, particularly in charities and third sector organisations at the moment. So there's loads of really interesting theory that can help you think about power and, and, and your role and responsibility in it. Um, I've, I've given a couple of other sources about accountability, um, accountability, kind of perhaps membership accountability, public accountability, and, and, and uh, Gooden really talks about um, uh, creating accountability based on how we operate, not just what we operate, uh, which, which I think is quite interesting. Uh, and the Cranfield yeah, University School of Management, the Doherty Centre, have done loads of there's like tools online and stuff that you can use to start to think about stakeholder mapping and kind of how that blends with social responsibility that I think could be quite useful. Um, I'll hand over to Kalina to, to, to leave a final provo provocation. Can I have the next slide, please, Molly? Thank you. Um, we felt that um, we, we've we had long conversations and the session that Ben and I ran before was a, an hour long session. And obviously we could talk about power, uh, accountability, a partnership approach for a lot longer than the 15 minutes we've been given. But we wanted to leave you with a question in terms of what does it look like for you? Um, and what can you do to, to maximize the impact that you have on our students and, and pose those questions about um, what would you like them to do differently? Um, and how will you induct your officers and your staff uh, into that relationship um, that you want to, to develop? Equally, what you need to kind of do is have an honesty with yourself about where your institution is currently at. And actually, rather than just saying you want it to happen, what will you do to make it happen? Um, and sometimes that's quite easy for sort of people to say, yes, our relationship is fantastic and it's great. And sometimes that's not. But actually, rather than just asking the question, you potentially need to do something about it to in in order for your relationship to to improve. Um, if you go back to kind of analogies about romantic relationships, you need to put the effort in on both sides for it to work. And sometimes there is one person we need to address that sort of power imbalance. Sometimes one person needs to kind of put out more in order to get that balanced uh, relationship back on track. So those were questions that we wanted to leave with you to for you to consider from this session. Sadly, we haven't been able to go into as much detail as we would have liked or um, cover the areas in, in a great detail, but um, we hope you found some useful context in, in what it is that we've had to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, really a whirlwind of interesting like perspectives and philosophies and approaches and really interesting examples. And um, again, I've wrote down loads of questions, so I'm. I'm conscious that if we if we get to the round table, we're probably not going to have enough time for all of the questions that I've written down let alone your own. Um, but thank you so much. It was really, really interesting. Um, and I'll hand over to Andy now. Um, just to say, um, when Ollie invited me to speak at this event, he said he was interested in me talking about my career journey and specifically what I've learned as one of a number of people who you'll find um, knocking about the sector who've, who've made that move from sabbatical officer to SU staff member and then over to the dark side uh, as a university um, uh, staff member. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm just going to talk about me for a bit and, and things that I and things that I found. Um, to be clear, um, some of this is unlikely to be earth shattering, um, and some of it echoes what I've, I've heard from the other speakers already, but hopefully anyone watching this will find that repetition and, and reassurance of what they already know helpful uh, as we go through. So next slide, please. So I started my... Uh, uh, I put sabbatical years because I ended up having two. I started my uh, uh, career as an officer at York St. John before doing a year that wasn't advertised as a sab year. Um, it was advertised as a, a fixed one-year contract, but um, but texturally felt very like a sab year because I ended up joining a team uh, of other sabbaticals and working in a way that felt very very sabbatical like, and that was under a trustee board. Um, and 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 the tone was very very similar to being so. Um, what was helpful about that was that there were two very different institutions, and it, it kind of relates to what uh, Kalina and Ben were just saying about understanding the you know the particular culture at those institutions. Um, it might seem really obvious, but the first thing uh, that I think everybody has to do is understand the institution you're working with. You know, if you want to create change, you, you need to know the specific circumstances of that organisation that you're trying to change, and that's the people, the strategy, the culture the history, the ambitions, everything that fits around that. Um, as much as you can talk to your peers and you can, and you can get good um, learning from them, 
quite often an approach that works in one place can't be directly transplanted into another place. You have to adapt to fit what's going on and, and working in an institution like York St. John and then moving to a collegiate institution like Durham is just a really stark realisation of that. Um, it also, um, part of what happened when I did that was I moved from I idealism to pragmatism. I think, I, you know, when I started as a, a, as a cell, I came in, as most people do, with grand visions about what could be achieved in the time it was available only to be hit with a kind of hard wall of reality about what's actually possible in, in the time that you have available. And it's easy to become disheartened and disillusioned in those circumstances. So I think it's important that you, that you try and frame things as realistically as possible, as early as possible, and um, working out what's achievable in one year and what is going to take longer is a crucial part of that. And, and the analogy that I often use, and there will be a number of analogies in this presentation, um, is that the best way to, to visualize an officer here sometimes is to see yourself as one part of a relay team, in that sometimes you're the one who's exploding off the blocks and starting the race. Sometimes you're the one who's bursting through the finish line and, and, and picking up the prize. But a lot of the time, you might just be picking up the baton from somebody else and carrying it a little bit further down the track before you hand it off to somebody else. And knowing that's where you are, knowing that that's important, because the change that you're trying to engender might take a number of years, can really help you in terms of not falling into that sense of like, oh my God, what have I done? Um, when actually you've done a very important uh, important role of carrying the ball up the field. Um, I think the, the kind of counter to that, um, and you know, and if you're feeling that that's depressing, well, actually, you know, there's quite a lot of things that are really positive. Um, that I learned from being in a sabbatical uh, role, if you see it in the round, um, you know, the opportunities you get in that role compared to when you move into other roles are phenomenal. And beyond the vast majority of other jobs that you get, even if you're leaving to enter a graduate job after leaving the university. And part of that is that it's 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 what makes the sab role more than just a job. Um, I understand why certain student unions, when they've been trying to promote their sabbatical roles, have, have promoted the salaries as part of that, looking to get people to engage and run for office. But to me, it, it, it misses the point because it frames things in the wrong way. This isn't just like any other job. SUs are never going to be able to compete with, with graduate recruiters on salaries. The focus I think we have to have is building on engage, engagement pathways right from the start um, to make sure that we've got a good pipeline of people coming through, whilst also highlighting all of these other opportunities that you get as a sabbatical that you'll that you'll not get in a frontline job. You won't get to sit on these particular recruitment panels. You won't get to enter these rooms. You won't get to make these decisions entering most jobs after university. But you do get that as a sabbatical, and that's what's really important. Can I have the next slide? You particularly notice that when you when you take off the uh, the the hat of power. And move from being a sabbatical and, and move to being a staff member, particularly a frontline staffer in a student's union. And it can be a really jarring experience, quite a humbling experience, when you realise that the reason that people were interested in you was not because you're amazing and brilliant, although obviously you are, you know, I was, um, but more because you, of that chair that you sat in. Um, and I think part of the, the, you know, if you want to successfully make that transition, it's how quickly you can make that emotional adjustment. Um, to get settled um, and, and, and get productive, because actually that, that challenge of moving uh, from, from one role to another is, is, really, quite, is really quite difficult. Um, and I think when we talk about challenge, though, one of the other things I wanted to raise is that one of the, one of the uh, things that I found from my brilliant SU career was that there's, there's a mythology around the sabbatical officer, which is actually unhelpful quite a lot of the time. Um, I think you know, some of that is that that thing about the power that you hold and, and, and the habit you hold, but also there's this belief that because you've been democratically elected on a particular manifesto, that means that the views are, are, are valid and should always be supported and the proposed actions that they put forward should always be supported, no matter how realistic they are. And I think this was referred to in, in, in the previous um, presentation a little bit, that, you know, if, you, if you're not careful about, about addressing that and challenging that, Actually, that fallacy can end up setting up offices for frustrations and failures. Um, you know, I feel that my, my role when I was an FU staff member was providing that check and challenge for officers so that they didn't come unstuck in discussions with universities or external party, uh, parties. 
because actually if you, if you don't go and come unstuck in those situations actually that can damage you further down the line i think i've put in here about cutting with the grain of the wood and pragmatism not fatalism which links back to what i was talking about like the move from idealism to realism i think part of that is is, is that understanding of what is isn't possible within the current culture and in the current environment um if you know if you as a staff you a staff member can see that the change that an officer wants is a five-year project you need to say that up front and not not to diminish them not to not to upset them but then to show them the pathways to how they get there and manage their frustration and um, that the world's not going to immediately change um and where you can adjust so that change is, is possible within the year and then the part of this that, that does that bit of kind of re-energizing is just making sure that you're taking every opportunity to highlight any change however small where it's been made so that people's motivations can be maintained I think quite often, um, you know, the, because the picture, the, the view in the in the officer's mind can be about the future destination stage. If they don't reach it in one leap, they think it's a failure. When actually, you know that actually this this is going to take three leaps to get there. It's going to take some time. And if officers are relay runners, then I think the staff in the SU are their coaches. And coaching is about balancing positive reinforcement with tough messages at times as well. Um, I, I mentioned why. This is important. I think this critical friend is important. You know that you have to be the one to tell them that they've got something in their teeth that that that, that the outfit doesn't suit them, because not only will that challenge help them understand the reality, it also means that they're not going to end up going into positions in the university where they then erode their credibility or damage the credibility of the wider institution to be able to create change both in that year and in future years as well. Um, you know, supporting officers means that they're never walking into rooms relying on personal experiences or the experiences of those who are most close to their ear because university staff can see that they can see when something's in individual when it's not systemic when it's not backed by data and if you do that too much then it damages the credibility not just of that officer but also of the su su as a whole i think the other thing that i learned when i was working in student unions was that it's difficult to see the whole of the institution, and I'll come on to why institutions are being difficult in a minute. But part of that is because when you're in the union, the union as a concept occupies a big lump of your brain and a big lump of your time. You know, and um, alongside the university, officers are often focusing on what's going on in the SU itself. You know, unions are their own little countries with their own people, their own politics, their own cultures. If you're an officer who's a trustee, you've already got your brain sliced in half by the separate hats that you're trying to wear. You're trying to push your political agenda, knowing that actually sometimes around that, there's going to be a part where you're thinking about the, the governance role that you have to hold and the emotional difficulty of holding those two positions sometimes can put you in a pressure situation before you even start to look outside of your country um, as to what's going on in the other countries in the university. And I use country as analogy very specifically. Um, Molly, do you want to uh, next slide, please? So when I moved into the university, one of the things that I realized was that actually from the from the SU, I'd only really seen a very small part, ever seen a very small part of the institution. Um, I had this flash of insight that framed my thinking ever since. Um, when people are outside of universities, they think that they're one entity, but when you're inside them, you know that like any large organization, what they are instead is a, a collection of individual kingdoms and fiefdoms, each with their own culture. And I visualize the university now, like it's the EU, that each of the departments, whether that's an academic department or a professional services department, they're like individual member states. Some of them are like France and Germany, they're really close to the center. Some of them think they're Norway or Switzerland and, and can't understand why they're beholden to the centre and why they can't just Brexit and take back control. You then play into that, the fact that, you know, the scale of the enterprise. My previous role uh, to being here at Sheffield was at, was at Nottingham. If you take the, the, the three campuses at Nottingham, the three international campuses, there was a staff and student community of over 50,000 people in that community. That's more than the population of Dover. Now, if the mayor of Dover stood up tomorrow and said, right, people of Dover, we're all going to do this one thing. We're all going to do this one thing. And we're all going to do it in this particular way. We recognize that it's unlikely that everyone in Dover would go, aye, aye, captain, 
you know, we'll all start acting in that way. You know, every business, every council service, every school, every hospital. Yep, of course, we're all moving in that direction. But for some reason, we think that vice chancellors have that power, that, that actually that we can just make one decision and that it'll just flow into the whole of this massive, huge scale structure that's really dispersed and everything will change. And by we, I don't just mean officers or staff members in students' unions or staff members in universities. Often it's parents, often it's government ministers. You know, they're the ones who have the same perception of like you can press one button and it can move. And it's, it's not the case, you know. Uh, when we stand back it from it and we observe it objectively, we can see that that expectation is ridiculous. And yet for some reason we seem to persist with it. Um, I was at a, con a, a conference once where someone said to me uh, that, you know, you know, creating change in a university is like turning a tanker. You know, it's a very slow process. And I said, oh, no, it's worse than that. It's not a tanker. It's a, it's a series. It's a flotilla. It's a series of small ships. And someone else, else interjected and said, ah, oh, no, it's worse than that. Some of them don't even think they're ships. And it's, you know, it's just a really good way of going, actually, this isn't one thing. There's loads more going on under the surface here. And what that means is that no matter how much we like, might like one, there is where rarely one lever that we can pull that just changes everything and changes everything in a really quick way. We need to stop thinking about things that way in large organisations, in organisations that are particularly dispersed in terms of power where you don't have lots of centralised command and control. Change happens most effectively when you're building from one or two areas outwards, when you work from building a consensus and growing that consensus to eventually snowball and change the institution. And I heard it in one of the other presentations. It's, it's, it's why mapping the stakeholders is so important. Against that backdrop, we've got to know who's who's best to target. Um, another analogy on the Andy Winter analogy bingo card that, that I have is that I think about any anything that we're doing, I think there are three doors that you've got in front of you. In front of the first door, there's a person stood in front of it with their arms open, they warmly embrace you, they're delighted that you're there, that they're really keen to do the thing that you want to do. But the second door, you think it's closed. And you go up, knock on it, and then what, what happens is you fall through it because actually it wasn't closed, it's already slightly ajar. And as you pick yourself up off the floor and dust yourself off, a, a person, normally an emeritus professor, spins around in their chair and goes, Oh, who are you? What, what's this? And you explain what the thing is, and they go, Oh, that sounds marvelous. And you realize it wasn't that they were particularly resistant to the thing that you were doing, they were just oblivious to it. It just hadn't even popped on their radar. And when you think about the scale of institutions and the dispersal of power, it's no surprise that people can be just stuck in their own world and not see beyond the edges of their desk or their office sometimes. They've been wrapped up in their own world, they've had lots of things going on, but they're not resistant, they're just oblivious. And then the third door has someone stood in front of it with a shotgun telling you in no uncertain terms that they want absolutely nothing to do with your thing. And if we're not alive to these stakeholder states, if we simply try to use power from the center to push change at everyone at the same time, we increase our chances of failure. Because all that happens is that instead of getting the huggers to inspire the unaware and get them to build up and snowball the resistance, we actually inspire the shotgun holders to go next door and arm the oblivious. And we really don't want to be in that situation. I think particularly because my ultimate piece of understanding when I've worked in both institutions is that because over the course of my career, what I found is that universities don't disagree with student unions about what's important. When you boil it down, we both want the same things. We want great students who have an excellent learning experience, who go on to have brilliant careers, um, and hopefully come back and give something back to that learning community that gave them that experience and that platform for the future. We know and agree on the destination that we're trying to get to. We're just, we're just a couple in the car on holiday bickering over the map as to how to get to that destination. And as such, it should never be a case that it's students versus the university. It should be a case that it's students and the university versus the problem. And anything that we do that frames it as an us and them narrative creates an unhelpful, unproductive tension. I say unproductive because it's not about always agreeing. Universities know that unions are there to exist, they exist to challenge the status quo and to get benefit for their members. It should always be about getting us towards that shared goal. 
if it's not about getting us towards that shared goal, if there is something that's going on that's creating that unproductive, unhelpful tension, then we need to go back and we need to analyze our motivations and understand what's going on and understand how we can work around that. Because for all the universities of systems, for all that they're the EU, actually they're run by people. They're run by humans with human emotions and people who, no matter how large their peer packets are, do feel it when they receive abuse on social media, do feel it when they're in a position of unhelpful tension. Um, and for, you know, I've met lots of, uh, you know, and I won't say a lot of, I've met some uh, colleagues when I've worked on both sides of the fence who are misguided or ill-informed, um, but there's not one person who I've, who I've ever worked with in university leadership in any of the roles that I've been in who didn't care about students, who didn't care about their education, just like officers and SU staffers, they care about what's actually happening here. And I think we should always hang on to that commonality when we're frustrated by the lack of engagement or the lack of progress on a particular problem. So there you go. There end of my sermon. There end of the lessons I've learned today. Thank you for uh, the opportunity and uh, thank, uh, to speak today. Thank you to Molly and, and Ollie for the invite. And uh, yeah, happy to take any questions that people may have. Thank you so much, Andy. And um, I've again written down loads of questions, um, and we'll um, uh, go through them at the um, roundtable if that's okay. Um, really interesting, and again, I, like you say, it, it complements the other sessions, but actually, it it's an additional layer, um, and exploring kind of the the both side relationship. Um, and 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 how that feels, I think, um, is is just really interesting. So thank you. Um, I'm going to hand over to Mac for our final session today before we go into the roundtable. Um, so take it away. Thank you. I'm now having the technical difficulty of not being able to find my slides. There we go. Um, brilliant. So I'm just going to do a quick like case study almost of um, one of the big exercises in partnership working. Um, during my term, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Mark. I'm the education officer at Newcastle University Students Union. Can I have the next slide, please, Molly? Thank you. Um, so I'm going to quickly run through um my experience of doing the te teaching excellence framework student submission. Um, how this was an opportunity for partnership working. What our student submission looked like. How we worked with students in this and with the university. I know that isn't exactly the focus of today, but I think if we're what work, I think we should always be talking about partnering with students and then the opportunities and outcomes of that. And there's a very happy picture of me finally submitting um, in January, which was wonderful. Um, next slide, please. And so um, in the fear of not patronizing anybody that already knows about TEF, but um, when I started my role in June, um, I was unsure about what a student submission would look like, what the point of the exercise was, and this is um, a little bit because of OFS's lack of guidance on this and lack of releasing it in time. Um, but this was a really unsure opportunity about what the point of it was and how we would be able to work with the university on this, whether we would collaborate. Um, so a lot of the conversations and a lot of these working groups had started pre my term with my predecessor, and um, I didn't know what what the baseline was, what what was going to be expected of us. Um, but in terms of uh, what the TEF cycle for this year looked like, it included a student submission for the first time, and this differed a lot from the prior submission. It differed in terms of waiting. We weren't sure what the waiting would be. This would depend on the quality of the evidence gathering and how representative it was. And um, it wasn't a requirement, which is interesting in terms of value with student voice from OFS, but that's a separate point. Um, but um, it was also an expectation, and that comes down to capacity and resourcing as well of student unions of how much time do you have and how much time do you have to work in partnership with the university on this when you're juggling other priorities like industrial action and the cost of living crisis um, and any of your other officer priorities. So if we can just go into the next slide, please. Um, so this to me was a real opportunity for partnership working. This is one of my favourite parts of the process. Um, as much as it was quite stressful and and it was um, a big task. It was a really good opportunity for partnership working with the university through a regulatory piece of work. Um, so as an officer, I was thinking about what the data is going to say and how I'm going to present it. And as Andy kind of touched on there, we were working towards the same goal here. Um, we just have two very different ways of getting there. We've got two very different submissions. One's giving student perspectives on the student experience and student outcomes. And the other is giving a bit more of a, sell it's a selling piece, essentially. And we know that these documents are going to be published, that they're going to be public. And this was really interesting when we think about partnership working is that 
we're not necessarily, it's not like we're writing a paper on library services or academic skills and we're presenting it to a committee with lots of data to try and make a change in or make recommendations in not a small area because these are big areas in education policy, but this is a holistic piece. This is the full student journey. This is student experience and student outcomes and using this as an opportunity to um, create a productive piece of work that has longevity, that is about enhancing the educational experience from both sides with the provider and the student submission was really important to us. Um, and I've put a little bit there. So there was really clear opportunities for partnership working through co-creating educational gains framework. And I think that links in again to how both the provider and so both the university and the student union saw this whole project as a as, a as a longer piece of work this isn't just submitting a regulatory um submission to the ofs this was how do we use this requirement as an opportunity for us to work together to look at what our student offer is and to make enhancements to it now rather than when we wait for nss in july and then we make reactive responses how do we do it in year and how do we make these changes which we've been seeing for the past four years if not longer um if i can have the next slide please Thank you. Um, again, this is another promotional picture of me pressing submit. Um, but this was um, student voice was at the heart of our submission. So it was 10 pages, student perspectives on student experiences, student outcomes, and um, what we did, um, as many people on the on the call and um, that will be watching this will know, is that we were collating and synthesizing four years worth of student voice data um, in 10 pages. And we used data from our education awards nominations. We used data from our student surveys, which we've done. We've used data from our student staff committee reports, our school rep reports. And we made sure that we kept that student voice at the heart of the submission, which was a really good tool to be able to put down and all in one place, present it to the university and say, this is, these are, these is what, um, this is what students have been telling us. This isn't news to you. We, we most likely know all of this, but it's all in one place. It's the full student journey. And then how can we work together before we make that submission and afterwards on making those changes, those enhancements, the student experience. Um, next page, please. So as I said, um, this isn't necessarily the focus of today's session, but we worked in partnership with students as much as possible, um, and as much as was possible, um, because we only got the guidance from OFS in October and we were submitting in uh, January. Um, but the data we were using was, um, as I said, like student staff committee reports, everything as much as we could get that we already had, but then additional evidence gathering, we were trying to work with students as partners throughout this whole process. Uh, specifically working with our school reps um, who are more senior student representatives um, and making sure that we were communicating the stages of writing this process so they, they, they were in the loop as much as possible and that they, they felt that this was their submission as much as it was just a student union submission um, and we invited them to read our draft before we shared this with the university and that was really important to us was that if anybody was going to see our submission first it was going to be the students and that they would be able to make comments on it that we weren't making assumptions about their experience that actually they could make comments they could add things they could take things out and we were very happy to co-create that with them um, and then at that point um, seamlessly I'm going to move on to the next slide um, which is the partnership working with the university and um, a lot of a lot of um, the other presentations have touched on how we can come into conflict on things like this, especially with a regulatory piece of work um, that is public, that is going to be published. This isn't an internal paper um, and how this can cause some stress. Um, and we worked really well together with the university, but obviously lots of things were happening in silos. We were working on our submission quite independently for some time and deciding how long you hold your class to your chest was really tricky. When do you decide, right, now's the time to share our draft and knowing that we're going to have a, light, a little bit of a shock because it's an, as much as the OFS wanted an honest experience, an honest representation of what the student experience, the student outcomes was, we also have to be aware that we're still navigating these relationships that we've been building over the past, well, beyond my term, this is a long term um, relationship building um, and partnership working with the university. So when do we share, when do we share our draft and how do we use that opportunity to make enhancements and to take this as a productive um productive opportunity rather than um rather than creating risk essentially which is um something you have to navigate as an officer and as a student union um so we're looking then at how do we turn this into a productive piece of work that has longevity and we presented it with the bit with the baseline of this is what students have been telling us this is what you already know about the student experience now let's reflect on this and let's use this as a driving force right now for changes and enhancements to the student experience. And we went through each section, we've had forms of um, suggestions about how we could make those changes now and how we could look at action plans. Um, and it was a really 
you can do this typically if we did um, I've done reports on hidden course costs and we've taken it to university different committees and we've traveled through the governance and then we've made recommendations and now we're acting on those and that was a long process and that was just doing through one survey but this was the full student journey this is everything from academic support teaching and learning assessment and feedback uh, career support educational gains this is a huge piece of work so to be making asks and to be making suggestions on the whole student journey in one area was a really rich opportunity for student unions i think um and particularly what we were doing at newcastle and that history of partnership working which is a lot of what paul talked about about that whole that whole process how you work with the university constantly lays the foundations to be able to go in with an opportunity like this and to make real change and then i just quickly wanted to touch on um the external challenges that you face, challenges from the regulator um, in navigating this partnership working. Um, and you've got, we've, we, as I said, you've got to think about these relationships with the university, with uh, those key stakeholders. You don't want to risk those essentially um, by um, by going, by using an officer's will or priority. Or they've got a particular opinion about this. It's about giving that student perspective, the whole student perspective, using all that data to drive it so that it's an honest and reflective account of the student experience. And that obviously is important when you think about block grants and that will be more important to some university unions than others. Um, I w we work really closely and really well together at Newcastle, but I know that that was some concerns of other officers is that if we write a really harsh um, student submission and we don't work collaboratively, we don't work in partnership, then there are risks of block grants. And then um, the point about um, if students, uh, if if you knew that your provider's student ex outcomes measures and those metrics and the student experience measures metrics were already borderline that they were in red, um, and that a student submission could push it into requires improvement. How do you navigate that? How do you navigate that partnership working when you know that there's a potential of two hundred and fifty pounds per student that's going to disappear and will most likely damage the student experience when you could be losing courses, you could be losing wellbeing services, you could be losing academic support. So that was a really tricky, um, and we, thankfully we weren't in that position in Newcastle, but. I imagine that some others were. So there's a lot of external factors when you think about partnership working. It's your internal things and it's also your external. It's, um, so there are benefits to a regulatory piece like this, real opportunities, but also that challenge of how do you navigate that? And that's purely luck and circumstance about what university and what um, institution you're at. Um, next slide, please. So as I said, and I kind of said throughout this, is that using this regulatory piece, this opportunity from uh, OFS and TEF, oh, this is me doing my little dissertation photo. Um, everyone at Newcastle kind of takes their dissertation photos by the arches, and I made sure I got professional photographer at um, work to take it with us. Um, but yeah, so we saw this as having longevity. We saw this using this regulatory piece of, of the framework as an opportunity to redefine what our student offer is and to align our submission with the provider submission um, and to make an action plan. And this action plan was about 10 things long. Um, and that was decided, we presented our draft in December to the university. That's when we showed our cards essentially, which was ahead of the deadline. And again, that depends on capacity and resource. We were very lucky that we were able to do that. Um, but I know that not everybody will have been able to, um, and we we're able to create an action plan of areas of enhancement. And that included commitments to timetabling, exam support, decolonizing the curriculum, personal tutoring, wellbeing advisors. And these were all student driven, student led because the student voice was at the heart of this. And um, in working together on this action plan, we've been able to continue this constant process of engagement and partnership working and putting students at the center of our practice. And TEF was a really good opportunity to do that um, because we were able to present a really holistic picture of the student journey and make those changes now rather than being reactive in July when NSS comes. So um, yeah, those are my reflections really is that um, working, with, working with the institution is massively important throughout all that you do. And it really lays the foundations for when you get regulatory pieces like this and like APP, which is coming up um, to actually make asks and to make, to decide that this is an opportunity, not just to do a submission to the regulator, but to actually how can we use this opportunity to reflect ourselves as officers and as institutions on what the student experience looks like and then what changes can we make in the real terms and immediately and that's me done thank you so much mac um a really interesting case study of partnership working and the power that exists within that relationship when going through such a process i think um something that it really summarized actually that a lot of things that we spoke about today around the relationships of stakeholders uh, within the student union and with the university um, and, and with students. Um, the importance of data um, and some of those motivations around change for um, universities 
whether that is PR, whether that is a regulatory submission. Um, <clears throat> and actually the opportunities that arise amongst that collaboration and that collaboration isn't necessarily always easy um, to navigate. So thank you so much for exploring that. Um, and it, it was a really interesting case study to help us um, kind of uh, reflect on some of the sessions today. Um, I'm going to um, kick us off with the first question, if that's okay, um, unless anyone's got any burning questions straight away. No? Fabulous. I'll kick us off um, and, and see where that leads, if that's okay. So um, a lot of what we spoke about today was around um, sort of large momentum change um, and the relationship of maybe sort of campaigns. So we've talked about kind of the cost of living crisis. Um, and I just wanted to see how we feel that the relationship with the union is able to represent students on maybe smaller, more intricate issues around timetabling. Mac, you, you started to touch on this um, around kind of those more uh, nuanced um, issues. I don't know if anyone's got any uh, sort of thoughts on that where they're not necessarily maybe widely felt, but deeply felt within an institution. Um, I don't know if that's... If I could kick off. That's Fabulous, right. thanks, Matt. Yeah. Um, I think with those more nuanced and, as you say, like quite deeply felt issues across institutions, I think this is where we need the support from universities to really empower our representation structures and to really value our reps that are doing that work. Because it often feels like the job of student unions has now become, since the pandemic, is to not to deal with, but to try and work on those big high level things. Um, like the cost of living crisis, um, like industrial action and so on. So I think that's where we really need the value. We need universities to value our reps and then to empower them. And we need those really good staff facilitators. We need those strong staff members to support them and to be able to make change at that local level um, and address that across the institution. Thank you. I think that's really interesting. Um, Andy, I know you've got your hand up. Yeah, so uh, there was a couple of points I was going to make about this. The first one was obviously thinking about Again, if you're mapping, mapping the circle without being clear who's uh, alive to these kinds of issues, I think um, there's been a greater understanding as, as universities are engaged in more DDI agendas about the, the kind of more deeply felt within particular communities and being able to see them uh, less than kind of mass issues. Um, so finding those, those people who have that commitment to those kind of work and, be, and can be your Trojan horses for some of those discussions is always really useful, I think. The, the point I was going to make with, though was, was was cautioning about the, the scaling of the problem and understanding the scale of the problem and that what might look like a small change might actually be much bigger than somebody might might appreciate. So a, a, a situation we've got at the moment uh, in, in Sheffield is around uh, we, we have, as I think a lot of people do, concern about extenuating circumstances processes and the amount of EC claims that come through and the ability for students to, to access that system and the kind of evidence that's produced. When I was engaging with our officers, they were saying, oh, well, we could utilize our wellbeing officers to, to just issue notes to students and that would be easy to do. And you're like, well, it sounds easy to do, but actually the practicality of the administration of that process behind the scenes, the burden of what you're going to get in terms of the requests coming forward could actually overload that, that system. And stop well-being advisors being well-being advisors. They might actually end up then just being administrative processes. So sometimes something that looks like, oh, that's quite simple. We can make a change there. You know, it's not really simple because what we've not done is scope the whole scale of that problem behind the scenes. It's not small. It's actually bigger than people think. Absolutely. Um, I think we've probably all got many examples where we've done something or thought something like that. Um, ben? Yeah, I... Um... Uh, I think it's a really good question, actually. Um, I think, well, th the first thing you made me think about is how sometimes someone will tell the students' union that in dealing with that isolated issue to do with a, a, a real minority group, we're being too niche. They'll say, well, you know, what, what about the critical majority, Ben? What about the critical mass? Stop, stop, stop pandering to small. <laughs> think about the average student. And then, you know, a week later, we'll be told that we're pandering to the average student and we're forgetting the minority groups. And, and often it's the same person who, who levels both criticisms 
at the, the student union. And I've seen that in many, many student unions. And I take a certain amount of pride in, in, in both of those criticisms, actually, um, because I think what it shows in, in, in net is that we're trying to do both. Uh, we're, we're trying to understand majorities. We're democratic organisations, so we're very interested in majorities by design. Uh, we're also very, very proud of our liberation histories and our attention to the forgotten voices and, and, the, and the people who, who who can't be heard by 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 you know larger forces, and so they come and chat to their friendly welfare officer or whatever it might be. So, so we're proud of both of those things, and, and we should try and use both of those things. I think. Um, it does go back to the principle a number of us have mentioned, which is where you can share the, the, the challenge, regardless of whether it affects one person or 100 people or 1,000 people, um, you are more likely to solve the challenge. And I don't think there's anybody, you know, regardless of whether it's a vice chancellor, a CEO, an officer or a welfare advisor, who would ever turn around and go, well, it's just one person, I don't care. Um, I, don't, I don't, just don't think that person exists. So, so the principle of sharing the, the problem is is sound. And I think, you know, Andy gave a nod to EDI there. I, um, I mean, I, I do think the conversations around equity, increasingly equity rather than kind of slightly old fashioned views of equal access. And I'm delighted that increasingly we're talking about equity. I think the quality of conversation has is, is improved dramatically over the last 10 years in universities and students' unions. And we are increasingly aware of and trying to understand issues of equity, which almost by definition means we, we are looking to hear the, 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 the least heard voices and, and to try and uh, engage with them and, and address their concerns. So I, so I think using an EDI lens is a good lens if you need a lens in order to leverage a response. Absolutely. Thank you. Um is is there anything else anyone would like to say on that matter? Because I do have some more questions. <laughs> no, um, fabulous. So, um, a lot of the sessions today have mentioned around the share, the partnership um, of unions or guilds or universities or colleges, actually having a shared end goal. Um, I wanted to touch on kind of the complexities that actually sit within that because I know often when I talk about a good student experience, that term good is so broad. And actually, um, there have been instances where we disagree about what is good. And so the end goal suddenly changes and we don't have the same end goal, especially, and this might actually happen more, I'm thinking of from experiences, actually happens when you're representing an educational experience um, on behalf of someone who's actually not having a very good experience. but uh, an academic or a member of the university feels like it is a good experience and actually that that differing what is good is really hard to mitigate and I just wondered if anyone wanted to talk about um the power that exists within that and the relationship and how we how we work out is there a homogenous good for everybody um I know that's probably quite broad and <laughs> maybe I don't know if anyone's got anything to say on that Thank you, Ho, <laughs> saving me. I would have carried on talking. No, that's fine. Um, I think that one of the kind of ways that I um, kind of, I don't want to say scared us around that issue, but try to kind of find that um, the way that works in, in, in the case of like, what does good mean? Because it changes so much. And because I think even from an SU and university perspective, just putting like, you know, just our understanding of what constitutes a good student experience is so different as well. And then you add the students, like, you know, direct student input, and it's like, whoa, okay, the three completely different angles here. Um, I think that for me, what helped was, I think, first and foremost, making colleagues at the university understand that there wasn't a one-size-fits-all approach. So what worked in one faculty or what worked in one department wouldn't necessarily work in another. I mean, when you try and take a small cohort like... Um, I can't think of a small cohort, cohort at our university now because all the ones I engage with are quite big. When you take a small, small, more niche um course or a, or a department that's quite small, and then you try and you know take the same approach and apply it to one of the biggest cohorts that we have, law and medics, it won't work. Like you know, the communication will fail. They won't feel supported enough. There will not. It will just fall apart basically. And I think that's where I started the conversation when it came to. Good student experience and how that how we can actually foster that is 
who are we actually trying to foster that good good experience for? You know, try and like size it down to smaller groups. And I know it kind of links into your previous question about like, you know, looking at it from a small scale issue first and, and kind of taking it from there, but actually breaking it down. So, you know, is it the entire student population? And in that case, what is a particular part of student experience we're looking at? Is it, you know, the amount of time they spend at university, the social, the, the, the social next curricular activities they have, you know, the education and the actual teaching experience, what part of it are we looking at? Safety, whatever. Or actually, if it's a certain department or a certain faculty, a certain school or group of students, then what specifically is a makeup of that? And what then can we look at as being the biggest barriers to that, you know, to to them having a good experience, I think. And so I think in whenever I've kind of had experience of student experience in the last few months, it's always been released in SASH students. And already that kind of gave a bit of a stare as to what good would mean. So it would, you know, it would constitute looking at support, looking at, you know, English not being a first language, financial barriers, understanding and integration into a different way of living, a different community, a different city, and orientation and that and the pre-arrival part. Um, but certainly that approach would would not work for home students or for someone like myself who is from Leicester and knew the city so well to so doing a whole host of pre-arrival activities would be useless because I know the city inside out yeah. and the people are giving the tours. Um, so I think that that has really helped me is kind of like, you know, who are we trying to foster that good experience for and then taking it from there. But also I think university staff can fall into a habit of it works for them so why won't it work for the for you know another group and I think it's very much we're there to kind of break that down gently and be like your heart's in the right place but that's not the way to go about it how about we actually listen to them first see what they need and then see if there's any like best practice we can then adapt and share and you know move over to this um to this new kind of cohort but just blanket copy and paste will not work in, in the university and I think that's not only the case with different cohorts and different um and like different departments, but also like, you know, year on year. So what worked for students last year will not work for students next year. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes it is just having that gentle, but I think honest conversation with colleagues um, about them having the heart in the right place, but like, you know, the processes aren't quite uh, matching yeah. up. Absolutely. I think definitely that evidence and that understanding that no one size fits all um, is, is so important in, in those shared understanding of of what is good um ben i noticed you you popped your hand down it was up yeah um uh look i'll be super quick the the, the boring management theory response to your to your question is that the, the an organization should try and define good through kpis and objectives and what and you smash them right um actually I'm, I'm i didn't want to talk about that i wanted to talk about the opposite of that which is community development and empowerment theory Absolutely. which says that it's the it's the beneficiary it's the member it's the service user who defines what makes them feel good and i think horse started to kind of touch on a, a kind of maslow's hierarchy of need there yeah about about understanding what will make you feel safe what will make you feel connected what will make you feel strong uh, and, and so on and so on and, and things that will make you feel strong might be different for me yeah um, but but so that's why I don't think the management theory necessarily fits I, I think I'd, I'd, I'd encourage people to look at empowerment and community building theory instead absolutely and I think actually that um one of the challenges we have is that both institutions haven't quite adopted that and we often assume we know what is good um even if we have maybe asked the questions and done some consultative pieces it's it's not a, a continual community driven process at the minute. Um, Kalina, sorry. Not at all. Um, I was just going to sort of almost turn that back on its head and ask you, should there be a homogenous good? And I was just thinking in terms of a good honours degree, um, we've kind of cast classified that a first and a 2-1 is a good honours degree, and that's great. But actually, what happens then to the student that got a 2-2? Do they feel less good? Do they feel less valued as a result of that? And actually, um, does that lessen the experience? If if good could be categorised in numerical terms and you put your people into various things, actually then surely we should be looking at the people that aren't good as opposed to the ones that are and how do we then sort of focus on those? So it's almost like you run the risk of ignoring what is good in order to concentrate on bringing those that are good, bringing the two ones, sorry, the two twos to two ones, bringing the thirds to two twos, et cetera. So just thinking about it from a that point of view, 
do you lessen the experience of anyone else by almost having a consensus view of what is good? And um, I remember once, and, and you might remember this this person, I'd kind of said that at De Montfort at the time, we weren't a political institution. And he said, you are, you're just asking them the wrong question. And I kind of come back to that in terms of we're just finding the wrong value of good. And actually going back to Ben, it's your value of good that should be the thing that you take forward. Um, getting a 2-2 isn't a failure in, in that kind of a concept and so we should celebrate what it is that that student has done and again it's it's looking at where someone started actually if you started from a really disadvantaged and I don't mean disadvantage in terms of advantage or privilege in that kind of sense but if you started from a different starting point actually the fact that you've had a positive experience should be what we're thinking of as in terms of being good as opposed to a metric that somehow kind of makes it all pretty and puts a bow around it so I guess it was what value is there in in having a defined good because someone else has to commit to that as a concept does that make sense it does thank you um I don't think we have time for all of my questions I've just seen the time which is typical um of me over ambitious um but I just wanted to um thank you all today for coming um and I know this is slightly off topic, um, but I think it's quite poignant in the sense that uh, it, I think it's something we should always reflect on. Um, can I ask you all to share kind of um, the the thing that you remember about your university experience? Um, whether that is how it made you feel, um, things that, if you think back to university, what's the first thing you think about? Um, I'm going to ask Hor to share hers first. As it was probably, <laughs> was the max was probably the most recent. No offence, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my second and third year was overshadowed by COVID. Um, so that was something. And my first year was overshadowed by uh, coming to university and having just lost my mother. So all in all, I'd say it was a very uh, big learning curve. I think I definitely... Um, it was very much I learned resilience in its true form and, and there's definitely a lot of like I think pride when I look back at it so when I actually graduated I wasn't bothered until I actually walked on stage and I was like actually the last three years have been quite intense okay maybe I've done well for myself um, so I think a lot of gratitude that um, I was able to do it and it it went the way it did and I can't lie a bit of gratitude for online exams as well let's yeah mixed feelings about those and the support students got but for me personally they were absolute godsend <laughs> thank you for sharing that and I am I'm really sorry about your loss um I think it's something really important for us all to remember is that your university experience is not the the only thing that you're you're not experiencing in isolation there are other things and uh situations going on for all our students Ben, would you like to share something that uh, the the main thing you remember from your university experience? Um, so uh, the first time I went to university, I failed. I failed miserably, and I dropped out quite early. It was the wrong course, the wrong place, the wrong time, and and, and I learned that those things need to be right. And uh, more recently, I, I went back and I, and I learned that if you get the right course in the right place at the right time, then it can be a really enriching experience. That you don't just learn from the textbook. You learn from your colleagues, your peers, you learn from your society and your club and the, the independent reading and, and, and you know, the things where you push yourself outside of your comfort zone. All of that comes together to make a wonderfully rich learning experience. Thank you. And um, there's no such thing as failure. It was just different. Um, Kalina, would you like to share yours? Okay, I was kind of thinking back that far. I was like, oh, goodness, I don't even know if brains go back that far. Um, I remember not really wanting to go to university. I think that um, I didn't go sort of immediately after college and I worked full time and then realised after very little time that I didn't want to work full time for the rest of my life and decided that university was the thing to do. And I think because I didn't go in terms of the sort of main way of going it was a very different experience I was the first in my immediate family to go and so I had no sort of expectations um the immediate thing as in whilst I was there was that it was my students union and this is cliched but it was my students union that got me through my university experience I remember 
at Christmas of year two, just going, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? I have no understanding of all of this. I don't know if I'm supposed to be here. Um, but it was getting involved in sort of volunteering projects that sort of made it for me. On reflection, in terms of my career since, I think one of the things that I learned is that whilst I was at university, the term BME, let alone BAME, let alone Global Ethnic Majority, whatever, just didn't exist. And actually, we were talking about um, attainment gaps that we are still talking about some 20 years later. Um, but I in myself kind of realized that I wasn't going to be defined by someone else's concept of what I should be. I am therefore a black person, a woman who is black. I'm not going to achieve anything. And I think for me, it was quite demoralizing that statistics should say that about me. I was going to be who I was going to be, yeah. success or failure, success or development. It was yeah. my journey and I wasn't going to be defined by that. So that was an on reflection piece of my experience. Thanks. Thank you, Kalina. Um, Andy? Um, yeah, I just remember all the horse-drawn carts and the ground <laughs> Um, You know, the world in black and white and sleepy of tones. And I think, you know, I, I would disagree with you. That I think it's important that we acknowledge that theory does exist and that that's fine. Actually, I, I just frame it slightly differently. Okay. Than it. Everyone experiences some form of failure. Um, yeah. When I think back to my university experience, I think more about how utterly unprepared I was for it as, as first in the family going to university and how I just kind of felt like I was on a conveyor belt, just did what was expected, went to the only university that gave me uh, an actual um, offer, uh, you know, put in, you know, my UCAS was a mess because I didn't know what I was doing, um, you know, but actually had a, had a really great experience because of the community, uh, went to somewhere that was that was really small and supportive found an engaged community through the through the students union and that, that actual experience has had more of an impact on my life than the course I did. I did I, I you know I did an English degree, so I'm qualified for nothing. You know, I can be a teacher, a journalist, or work in WH Smith's, like those are the <laughs> options, right? Um, but but actually as Ben was saying, the kind of wider picture of all of these things. I talk now a lot about how it's a transformational experience and um, you know the 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 curriculum is just it's just the foundational bit that, that you build from if that's not right then you then you are doomed to failure because actually your foundation wobbly if you've not got that right but it's the build out of that and you know the number of people i know people in this room who've worked with through students unions who they meet who go you know come to university going i'm going to be a physicist and leave going i'm going to be a lighting designer because <laughs> you know they got involved in the, in the theater group and that set them off like you know i thought i was going to go and work in london and now i live in china i've met this girl and now i'm living with her and like it's just this space where where change happens Absolutely. and that change is the big institutional change but it's also the small personal change so, yeah. yeah thank you um mac I'm also going to be cliche and I'm going to say the people, but I don't mean like friends and students. I mean, um, I'm like all my experience was really disrupted because of the pandemic. But when I came back in onto campus in third year, um, it was sitting in like communal student study spaces on the corridor of um of my politics building and um as I did politics. And whenever whenever a staff member walked past, um, we recognised each other from Zoom and we would smile and wave or walk down a corridor and people would remember your name. And I think that was, it's the small things like that to me that people actually knew who you were, whereas in my first year, it was such a big cohort. Nobody seemed to know anybody, students or staff, and that was really dis, um, disengaging. But people remembering who you were and smiling and actually taking an interest in who you were as a person, those are the people which I remember about university more than institutions and processes and doing the essays. Thank you. Um, I just find it really useful to reflect on that um, as what our current students are going to take away and what is important when you're at university and there's a, a myriad of things that you've sort of all touched upon but I think the the connections um and the context is just so important um thank you for today I've kept you I said it was going to be shorter than two hours it's gone over two hours by two minutes and I am so sorry um I will uh, be in touch kind of when it's live and ready to go Thank you so much for, if you've got any questions or any follow-up stuff for me, any feedback, that's great as well. Um, but yeah, be in touch. It's been lovely. Um, and I'm sorry, it's kind of not the, the context that we uh, anticipated. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Oh, thanks, Molly. It's been great. Thank you.
See you later. So thanks, Molly. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.